Good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Mary Marrow, and I'm going to be your moderator for today's webinar. And I would like to just welcome everyone who's joining us today and acknowledge that I think we've got people from all over the country who um, have registered and are calling in. And so we're really happy to have you and hope that um, you're, you'll get some really good information from our presenters. I did also want to acknowledge that the webinar today is made possible through funding from the Minnesota Department of Health and the statewide health improvement partnership that is part of the part of MDH. As part of our webinar today, we will be exploring a number of important considerations impacting breastfeeding and expressing human milk at work. As indicated here, we will start with an overview to get us all on the same page and we'll then shift to different cultural, legal, and policy considerations in different settings and jurisdictions. And as Stephanie indicated, we really do encourage you to ask um, questions along the way. I'll do my best to keep uh, an eye on that. And we'd like to, as much as we can in this format, have it be as interactive and respond to the questions um, and spe specific um, things that you um, might have in mind today. So I'm an attorney at the Public Health Law Center, and the Public Health Law Center is a public health policy institute focused on using law and policy to address the key drivers of chronic health issues. The center is located at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in St. Paul, Minnesota, and those of us presenting today are located in the Twin Cities metro area. This region is known as Bedote to the Dakota and is the center of all things for the Dakota people. In addition to those of us presenting, participants in this virtual workshop are joining from across Minnesota and the United States on the traditional and ancestral homelands of many indigenous peoples. I would like to recognize and honor the diverse indigenous peoples connected to the lands which make up what the colonized system calls Minnesota and the broader United States. I am so thankful that despite the attempts of genocide and forced removal of indigenous nations on which the creation of the United States and Minnesota were based, that indigenous peoples live in Minnesota and in my community and my neighborhood, along with the growing movement to revitalize cultural traditions, languages, and ways of life that sustain the health of generations. I especially want to express my gratitude and appreciation for the deep values and practices of environmental stewardship in relationship with nature and land elevated by indigenous nations. I encourage you to reflect on the history of the land from which you are joining us today and how this history impacts and informs your relationship with the land and indigenous peoples in your community. As part of our work at the Public Health Law Center, we seek to intentionally bring an equity lens into our work that moves beyond a one-size-fits-all type of equality framework. As indicated on this slide, bringing an equity framework can create more just opportunities for individuals to be healthy. Likewise, an equity framework can also be used to support and promote the health of communities on a more systemic and community level. This equity approach recognizes that individuals and communities are often starting from different vantage points, lived experiences, and have different resources and opportunities for living healthy lives. Just as it is appropriate to respond to individuals based on their specific needs, an equity approach to community health seeks to, to identify, respond to, and provide targeted resources and support that recognizes the more systemic needs and opportunities of different communities and different populations within communities. As I mentioned, the Public Health Law Center seeks to use laws and policies to address chronic health issues and improve health outcomes. Our team of policy analysts and attorneys provide legal technical assistance to support this goal through legal research, policy development, implementation, and defense, publications, and trainings like we are doing today. However, we do not provide direct client representation or lobby. So with that, we have a really great panel of presenters lined up for today's webinar, including Melanie Plusinski with the Public Health Law Center, Corey Walton with the United States Department of Labor, and David Skopolk with the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry. 
I'm going to turn it over to Melanie now, who's going to get us um, started with some background information. Melanie. Thanks, Mary. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just going to start by saying Buju Anin Indijnikaz Nenukasikwe. That's my Ojibwe name. I'm Melanie Plusinski, um, enrolled member of the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, policy analyst for the Public Health Law Center currently. So just to share a little bit about my journey to tribal policy work, I grew up in northern Wisconsin on the reservation there and learned at an early age what inequities existed between tribal members and non-tribal members who lived in the neighboring rural city. My grandma was the director of social services there for the tribe and would share with me stories about families, their struggles, and also about their resiliencies. I was fortunate enough to be able to learn cultural practices and food ways growing up. Um, so you could see in the photos, there are photos of myself and my family harvesting fish together. We also harvest wild rice and practice other traditional food ways. And for me, learning my cultural ways supported me to want to work to advance equity. And I found my path to public health, where I learned that policy is a means for creating sustainable positive change for indigenous people and for all people. Uh, so today we are focused on breastfeeding policies. And why are we focusing on breastfeeding policy? Um, my reasoning is that breast milk has been the traditional first food and first medicine of indigenous communities throughout North America since time immemorial. Today, as tribal members, tribal nations assert their sovereignty in the realm of food systems, they're reclaiming the use of traditional foods to nourish the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual aspects of both uh, the human body and the greater communities. Uh, it was common throughout earlier generations for indigenous mothers to breastfeed their babies for at least two years, with some mothers carrying on to practice for longer periods of time, sometimes up to four or five years. And research has revealed um, what American Indian and Alaskan Native people have known for millennia, that the bond between a mother and her child is sacred. And this form of intimate bonding supports healthy child development and consequently healthy communities. And breastfeeding has been a means to connect Indigenous peoples to their first food and first med medicine and the benefits to health are profound. Creating policy that is culturally relevant supports reestablishing norms in indigenous communities and their workplaces that promote breastfeeding and also protect those who are expressing their human milk to give life and health to babies. So I'll share just some brief definitions and terminology that's common and critical in the development and implementation of tribal breastfeeding policy and breastfeeding policy in general. So when we're talking about tribal sovereignty, uh, we're referring to the authority of a tribal nation to self-govern, including to determine governance structure, pass laws and enforce laws through po uh, police departments and tribal courts. When we're talking about historical trauma and its impacts. Historical trauma is defined as the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding across generations. This definition explains the historical impact of traumatic and genocidal actions and policies designed to eradicate American Indian people, their culture, language, spirituality, and traditional practices, breastfeeding being one of them. And we're going to be talking throughout the day, of course, um, breastfeeding and chest feeding. We'll discuss, um, it simply means feeding a baby or toddler human breast milk from a breast. And when I refer to first food, um, referring to the tradition of giving baby nutrition, connection, and medicine for their health, and food sovereignty being, um, being related, and that policy can help establish the right for a person to be protected in all spaces in order to safely deliver that first food. When we refer to human milk, we're talking about um, milk produced by mammary glands. It's the primary source of nutrition for newborns, containing fat, protein, carbohydrates, and variable minerals and vitamins. Lactation is the production and secretion of breast milk. When used in policies, it may refer to breastfeeding or the expression of milk uh, or both. And milk expression generally used to refer to pumping or expressing breast milk. It usually in written policy doesn't include breastfeeding or nursing of a child. Next slide, please. So just to reiterate about tribal sovereignty uh, and policy work, tribal sovereignty and trust responsibilities have been defined through the history of treaties, acts of Congress, executive orders, and court decisions. So this is a quote from Chief Justice Marshall, who served from 1801 to 1835, 
saying that Indian nations or affirming that Indian nations had always been considered as distinct independent political communities, retaining their original natural right as the undisputed possessors of the soil. The very term nation so generally applied to them as um, meaning a people distinct from others, which gives tribal nations the inherent right to create their own laws and policies that work best for their communities and their workplaces. Um, so I mentioned historical trauma and the impact that it has had on the loss of uh, the disruption to indigenous life ways and traditional practices, um, which was caused by the United States government and federal Indian law and policies that systematically led to many health disparities and inequities that are today experienced across Indian country. Breastfeeding is one of a myriad of indigenous cultural practice that supported good health and wellness and was disrupted by these policies. And we see the evidence of historical trauma um, in society in a variety of ways and just some examples our educational achievement gap, high dropout rates, high number of American Indian children and youth in correctional facilities, and also yeah, the loss of traditional life ways such as breastfeeding and giving that first medicinal food to young ones. Next slide, please. So how do we change the story and continue to move through trauma to improve health outcomes for future generations and really reestablish and advocate for that resiliency. We know that leveraging tribal sovereignty is a means for indigenous people to create laws and policies that will normalize or renormalize protecting traditional healthy life ways um, and breastfeeding for first food for babies, focusing on the policy change. Next slide, please. And um, just to just to visit some of the benefits to baby in establishing the policies in the workplace. Um, breastfeeding benefits include immune support, of course, protecting against bacterial and viral infections for baby, reducing risk of sudden infant death syndrome, and reduced risk of chronic disease, such as obesity and even cancer. Next slide, please. Um, more on the importance of breastfeeding policies in relation to mothers, so promoting emotional health for mothers, reducing risk of postpartum depression, and lowering rates of diabetes, cancer, and osteoporosis for mothers. And there is research into all of these areas of benefit that I'm referring to. Next slide, please. And so, um, of course, there are also benefits to employers. And so we're talking about tribal workspaces, but also outside of tribal communities, um, employers as well, who are employing indigenous um, breastfeeding or chest feeding mothers. Better recruitment and retention of people of childbearing age is a benefit to employers. Uh, breastfeeding mothers who are supported at work are proven to be more productive can have fewer distractions, um, less absenteeism, have more loyalty to the business or workplace, and have improved job satisfaction. Next slide, please. And so in my experience um, in tribal policy development, I just created this simple visual to kind of show the trajectory of how policy moves forward, um, how it plays out. And so where I started is just that the need is identified. We know that uh, the need is related to many things that have taken place historically and presently to create the need for the policy. I mentioned the genocidal federal policies, systemic oppression, um, economic instability are all things that lead to creating the need for policy change. Um, in the case of breastfeeding, lower rates of breastfeeding among American Indian and Alaskan Native women in relation to their trauma um, has helped just kind of identify the need for a policy change. So we want to increase those rates in order to promote better health outcomes. And so the need is identified. And then um, there is a group or a person likely who will champion that. It could be someone in the workplace um, who feels passionately about the issue. It could, in this case, be a a WIC staff person, it could be an elder or youth, it could be a coalition or another champion in the workplace who will support the policy and begin moving the process forward. 
Um, and then in relation to getting buy-in, um, that can, it's gonna look different in every community to get buy-in from leadership and community members, other employees in the workplace. It might look like presenting or tabling at community events, um, hosting educational appealing events for community members to share information and really being creative about channels to reach people in a meaningful way. And I included this because in tribal communities, the workplace is not necessarily removed from central community. So there's a lot of crossover in terms of getting buy-in. And then the next step in process, in my experience with tribal communities, would be to actually draft a policy. There may be, depending on the size or resources in the community or capacity available, it might be the tribal attorney who would do this. Um, or and or there might be a need for technical assistance, such as what the Public Health Law Center can provide. Uh, in technical assistance work, I have um, helped support in presenting a policy to tribal leadership. Sometimes that's helpful to have sort of the neutral public health entity there, um, but it also could be the attorney and or champion or other community members who take this on. And then implementation will occur uh, upon approval and subsequently training um, and other types of education will occur to help support the implementation process in the workplace. And then enforcement, um, again, will look different for every community, but uh, there likely will be protections within the policy, such as how does the supervising person perhaps deal with an unsupportive staff in relation to new breastfeeding policy, just as an example of what type of enforcement would look like within the policy. So I just wanted to emphasize the getting buy-in component in tribal communities. So as I mentioned, the workplace, like tribal departmental workplace or gaming type workplace, it's not separate from the community. So in order to establish sort of universal buy-in uh, for both employees and also their families, um, it's important to, these are some mechanisms to employ to gain that support. Um, and as a technical assistance provider with PHLC, I work to support some of these ways and as a part of policy development and the implementation process. And some of that looks like supporting coalition building um, and facilitating consensus with community members, and which include, of course, tribal staff, planning meaningful education events um, to get people both interested and engaged and one -on -one, building one-on-one -on -one relationships. So that champion or whomever it may be might actually go out in community and need to have conversations with people to get folks to understand the importance of the policy. And then being responsive and culturally relevant as a technical assistance provider, being super important and critical to the success of sustainable policy change and meeting people where they're at with policy knowledge. So if that means um, just the type of way in which you talk about policy, sometimes it can be scary or off-putting to people. So um, trying to find ways to frame policy change that's uh, relatable and approachable to everyone involved. So I know that my colleagues will go deeper into the details of these types of policies. So I'll just name them for now. Policies that we, uh, PHLC, and I have worked on with tribal communities include components such as space for expressing milk, time during the workday to express milk or nurse, flexibility in making time to express and store milk, and then protections for those who are needing to express or nurse. Uh, as I've shared about tribal sovereignty, just noting again that every federally recognized tribe is its own nation and policies will look different. There is no template for tribal breastfeeding policy. So just keeping that in mind when you do tribal work. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to include some helpful resources and link them here um, that are indigenous specific, a variety of types of resources that could help somebody in the policy journey um, and express related to expressing human milk in the workplace. So I listed the link to today's webinar, um, the Public Health Law Center resource in drafting effective tribal policy and law is a really good one um, as a reference. 
And then also our list of the American Indian Cancer Foundation's framework for indigenous foods resource, which includes culturally relevant strategies about promoting first food. And then Mother's Milk is Medicine is a cancer prevention infographic resource specific to indigenous communities and the health benefits of breastfeeding, if that could be helpful. And then the Great Plains Tribal Chairman Health Board have some really nice posters kind of thinking about raising awareness and doing sort of campaigning around the workplace and in the community. Those are some really nice uh, culturally relevant uh, poster visuals. And then also a model policy from Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe that could be useful in thinking about um, how the policy will look. That's a really nice concrete example. And then also included um, a relevant, uh, really short, but nice breastfeeding video highlighting uh, someone who has specific experience in moving tribal policy um, in the workplace forward in relation to breastfeeding. So with that, thank you. I will pass off uh, to Corey Bolton. Um, thank you. Melanie, before, I'm sorry. Melanie, before we I'm sorry, Corey, before we pass up, we have a couple questions specific to Melanie and, and also to, to Corey and David as they're coming. So I think we have a couple minutes. Um, I'm sorry, Corey, I didn't mean to cut you off. That's okay. Um, there's a specific question here, um, Melanie, and then I am hoping Corey and David, maybe you could speak to this in your presentation. Um, are state and federal breastfeeding support laws not applicable on reservations? Can this be clarified? And so, Melanie, I know that you touched on that briefly, but could you respond? Um, if we are talking about specifically on reservation uh, within tribal boundaries, then uh, the tribal nation would have jurisdiction over its own laws and policies. So state and federal law would not apply if the tribe decides to uh, do something differently that they have the inherent right to do so. Great, thank you. And then there's one other question, but I think I'm gonna hold that till the end so that um, other and then we can revisit that. Thank you, Corey. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you very much. Um, I'm assuming everyone can see my screen. Someone let me know if they can't. Does that look good? You're all good. Great. Good afternoon. Morning. Oh, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm again, I'm Corey Walton with the US Department of Labor Wage and Hour Division. And I'm going to talk to you about the federal guidelines, except the federal law as, a, as it relates to nursing mothers. David Scoholt is going to come up, come behind me and talk about Minnesota state law. And then all of you out here um, who, are, who are not necessarily situated in Minnesota, just be aware of if your state does have nursing mother provisions, just be aware of them and how they relate to, to federal law. If the two laws come, I call them collide, but if they all if they apply to, to the business or to the employees, um, always pivot to the one that's most beneficial to the worker. So if you have two laws, you got a state law and a federal law that apply to nursing mothers in the workplace, make sure if they say two different things, you always pivot to the one that's most beneficial to the employee. In essence, you'll be in compliance with both of them at the same time. Last thing I wanna say before I get started, after I get done, I'm going to drop some links into the chat box. So I'm going to refer to some links in the chat box. They're not there yet, but they'll be there when I'm done. So with that, I think I'll, I'll just launch right into break time for nursing mothers under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So under federal law, it's the FLSA, the Fair Labor Standards Act, that brings the nursing mother provisions into the workplace. So that's section, section seven of the FLSA. It allows for reasonable break time to express milk. So reasonable means um, it's not actually written in the law, but our policy for reasonableness is um, two to three uh, nursing mother breaks per eight hour shift and approximately 15 to 20 minutes per, per break. So that's what the general rule or the general guidelines to go by. Um, uh, this is supposed to take place in a place other than the bathroom. So under federal law, bathrooms strictly prohibited for use as far as providing um, the, the space for the mother to, to nurse. And then the nursing can take place anytime up to one year after the child's birth. Okay, so all those provisions were, were incorporated into the Fair Labor Standards Act in March 2010. 
Okay, so which employees could actually use this law to take the break? So which, which employees are eligible? So I'm gonna talk about eligibility in three little chunks three little chunks here. First, employees who work for a covered employer are eligible. And I'll talk about a covered employer in a second. Employees who are individually covered by the FLSA, by the Fair Labor Standards Act, I'll talk about that individuality in a second. And then there's a chunk or there are a group of employees who are exempt from these provisions. So what does that mean? So that means there are employees in the workplace for which the employer does not have to provide this time to express milk. And I'll talk about that group as well. First, let's talk about coverage. So which employees are gonna be covered um, by this law because their employer is covered by the FLSA as a whole? So employers that have at least two employees and they gross at least $500,000 a year. So those first two bullet points, those sub bullet points, that's the test. So two, employee, two employees, at least two employees and a half a million dollars gross annual sales per year. If that test is met, then every employee at every work site in every work week is entitled to take this time if she needs it. Second bullet there, let's say it's a smaller company, right? So they're both, maybe they're below the half a million dollar threshold. That employee could be individually covered by this provision if they're involved in certain types of interstate commerce activities. So what does that mean? The second paragraph there, interstate commerce activities typing letters and sending them across state lines, emails back and forth state lines, which many of us do as part of our job now, traveling back and forth across state lines. Maybe they work in a retail establishment and they're swiping credit cards all day long or a restaurant or a hotel or something like that. So if you have a company, if an employee is employed at an employer that has less than a half a million dollars, but they're engaged in these type of activities, she too can express milk. So under the FLSA, you have enterprise coverage and you have individual coverage. But there's a group of employees who are exempt from this provision. And they are what we call the white collar exempt employees. So there's three examples there on the screen, executive exemption, administrative employee exemption and professional exemption. So your executive exempt employees are your supervisors basically. Um, one of the links I'm gonna drop into the chat box is to our DOL fact sheet 17A. That fact sheet reminds you, that will remind you of what these exemptions are and which employees perhaps are exempt from, from, from these provisions. The administrative employees are department heads. They may not necessarily supervise any, any other employees, but they're a head of some department or subdivision. So they'll be exempt as well, as will the professionally exempt employees. So doctors, lawyers, teachers, um, those kind of employees are going to be exempt under this section seven. So just to recap, if you work for a covered employer, half a million dollars to employees, you're going to be covered as a whole. Every employee is going to be covered. If you're below that threshold, you work for an employer who's below that threshold, you might be individually covered and entitled to these provisions. If you fall into an exempt category, the employee can deny providing you the nursing mother's time. Okay, so the next question is, are employees entitled to be paid for this time? So first bullet, employers are not required to be provided compensation during this break time. So as a rule, the express milk nursing mother's time is unpaid. But second bullet, as with other breaks under the FLSA, under the Fair Labor Standards Act, the employee must be completely relieved from duty or break time must be compensated. So in other words, we had a case one time with the Department of Labor where the employee was expressing milk, but she was on a webinar right? Or she was on the phone or she's doing something that's job related. That's not completely relieved from duty. So if the employee does not want to have to pay for that time, he, she must be completely relieved from duty. Otherwise, it's work hours. <clears throat> Third bullet, if an employer already provides paid break time and if an employee chooses to use that time to express breast milk, she must be compensated for that time just as other employees would be compensated. That was one example I just gave you. Um, so if the employee, let's say the employer provides, you know, the old fashioned 15 minute mid morning break and 15 minute um, mid afternoon afternoon break and employees in general as a policy are paid for that time. If the nursing mother chooses to use that slot of time, that break, which is traditionally a paid break to express milk, then she too must be paid for that time. 
So what are the space requirements? So that's the paid and unpaid part of it. So what kind of space is the employer obligated to provide to the nursing mother? So first bullet, the employer shall provide a place other than a bathroom. So right off the bat, at bathrooms are prohibited. Bathrooms will not satisfy the requirement of space. Second little dash there, shielded from view. So ideally that would mean walls. So in an office with walls or maybe a manager's office or whatever. Um, it could also mean partitions. It could also mean if there's windows in a room that she's in, like for example, a conference room or a small conference room, there's windows, then they should be covered as well. So that's what shielded from view means. Third dash, free from intrusion from coworkers and the public. So what that means is ideally there's a lock on the door so she can lock the door when she expresses milk. If there's no, if there's not a lock on the door, it could mean something like signs out front. Maybe it's a partition, uh, a little area that's partitioned off. There should be some signs out there that would uh, that would make it free from intrusion. And the last uh, dash that may be used to to for, by an employee to express milk. The uh, the uh, last um, point on this slide: an employer may temporarily designate space or make space available when needed by the employee. The location must be functional as express as a space for expressing milk. So what that's saying essentially is it doesn't have to be a dedicated room for express milk year round. It could be something that's temporarily set up for uh, an expect a uh, mother to nurse, to express milk. And then when she's done and there's no other employee in the office that needs to do that, it can go back to the room that it used to the function that room used to serve. So it doesn't have to be dedicated year round for that purpose. But when, when it's needed by, by a mother who's expressing milk, it should be available. Some additional issues to uh, consider. Again, I already talked about securing space from intrusion. That's very important too. Um, space at adjacent to restrooms. Now restrooms are prohibited, but a, a space that's at adjacent to a restroom, like a locker room or, or maybe a lounge area, those areas would be sufficient um, under the law, as long as they are free from intrusion and shielded from view. So those requirements still have to be met regardless of what this room is or the space. Dual use rooms, what that means is, let's say if it's a manager's office that's, that, that doubles as an express milk area, that's fine. Again, it doesn't have to be dedicated solely for that purpose, but it has to be available and it has to be free from intrusion and uh, shielded from view. Storage of milk and pumps. So the employer does not have to provide, for example, a refrigerator but the employer does have to provide space to store the milk and the pumps. So for example, if the employee brings one of those, um, one of those um, insulators or one of those coolers to work to keep the milk, then the employer has to provide a space for the milk and the part, and the, excuse me, the pumps and the parts to the pump, et cetera. So the employer has to provide that space. And then finally, notice, which is important. So both the employer and the employee have a responsibility when it comes to providing notice. The, uh, an expectant mother should provide the employer notice that when her baby arrives, she's going to be expressing milk at work so the employer can make all the necessary accommodations. Now, on the flip side, if you're, if you're a manager or you're a boss or you're an owner and you have a, 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 an employee who's obviously expecting, then maybe you should ask, not maybe, you should ask the question, um, are you going to express milk when your baby arrives? And then again, that way the employer can make all the necessary accommodations ahead of time. I want to talk about this undue hardship defense. So this is an important point because Dave's going to talk about state law and this is federal law. And again, if the two say something different on the same issue, make sure you pivot to the one that's most beneficial to the employee. So what does undue hardship mean? First bullet, an employer that employs fewer than 50 employees is not required to provide break time and space if it would pose an undue hardship. So employers with fewer than 50 employees, so 49 employees or less, can claim this undue hardship and they wouldn't have to provide the leave or the time for, excuse me, not, not the time, but the, the space and the time for the, for the nursing mother to express milk if it would cause an undue hardship. So what does undue hardship mean? So you see that second, that top bullet on the, on the right side of the screen? Undue hardship is defined as causing the employer significant difficulty or expense when considering in relation to the size, financial resources, nature, or structure of the employer's business. So this is not automatic. So any employee who's below that 50 employee threshold doesn't automatically get to take advantage of this undue hardship defense. 
he or she, the employer, would have to prove that there is an undue hardship. So there's the burdens on the employer to approve some, to, to approve some type of undue hardship is not automatically applies to all employers with 49 employees or less. Um, and the last bullet on that page, when you're talking about you know fewer than 50 employees, that's everywhere that the employer has establishment, not just that establishment where that employee wants to express milk, but all establishment. So for example, if you have an employer at the establishment where, where, where an employee wants to express milk and there's, let's say there's um, um, 35 employees there, but they have three or four different establishments that also have 34, 35, 36 employees, of course, that's going to be over 50 employees combine all locations. And that employer would not be able to assert this undue hardship because they got more than 50 employees. Here's some additional resources, um, federal resources, Department of Health and Human Services toolkit. It's a really good toolkit. Uh, CDC has a, also has a toolkit. Um, and uh, again, you'll have this PowerPoint presentation so you can click on those links and find that information. Some other resources, again, this will be a part of the PowerPoint. So uh, you'll have access to that. And again, I'm going to um, turn this over to Dave Scoholt from the state of Minnesota. And he's going to take it from here. Unless, Mary, there's any questions? I actually do have a couple questions, Corey and David. Please, if you have anything to add to the questions, please do so. Um, so, um, Corey, there's one question here um, about the white collar exemption requirements. And thinking back to um, earlier, talking about the concepts of equity and policies, um, I'm just kind of curious if that kind of white collar exemption policy could create gender inequities in the workplace that could dissuade nursing mothers from pursuing or, main, or maintaining supervisory and managerial positions? That's a good question. I wish I could offer an opinion outside of my Department of Labor capacity, but I can just tell you what the law is and how it works. And then maybe I can give my opinion outside of nine to five. <laughs> That's about as far as I could go, but I understand the point and it's a good point. I understand the point. Thank you. Um, there's one other question for you, Corey, and David, you also might have something um, to add to this too. Um, how does one go about securing break time then for expressing milk if someone is employed at an entity with 49 employees or fewer? And I don't know if this is something that Minnesota state law, state law might address, um, but Corey, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, again, it's not automatic. Um, so don't think if your employee uh, excuse me, don't think if you work for a company or an establishment that has fewer than 50 employees, you're automatically not going to get it. The employer has to jump through that hoop. They have to overcome that burden. If there's a dispute, let's say, for example, your employer did deny that on those terms, on that undue hardship terms, and you feel like, no, there's no way. There's a minor inconvenience, but there's no undue hardship. The employee could always call our office and file a complaint and we could look into it and see if it did raise to the level of an undue hardship as opposed to just a minor inconvenience. So determination, that's not the final word just because that, that undue hardship exemption exists. If the employee feels the employer is taking advantage of that and it doesn't apply, by all means, they can call our office and we can look into it. Perfect. Thank you. All right. David, we'll turn it over to you. And then, and thanks everybody for all these great questions. We'll follow up with the remaining ones um, after David's presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you, Corey. Thanks, uh, Mary. And thanks for inviting Department of Labor and Industry to participate in this presentation. Um, I know, Corey, you're going to help me with the slides. If you could jump forward. And I will address some of those questions in my presentation. So uh, we can move to the next one. And uh, I am with the Department of Labor and Industry. Again, my name is Dave Scovolt, and I am in the Labor Standards Division, uh, which is very similar to the Wage and Hour Division on the federal level. So we uh, spend a lot of our time working on issues like minimum wage, child labor, uh, overtime, uh, the recently passed in 2019 uh, Wage Theft Prevention Act. Uh, we also administer and oversee parts of the Women's Economic Security Act. Um, and here on the screen, we see a description of, of WISA. Also, uh, we see the list of issues that DLI and labor standards oversees, including wage disclosure, nursing mothers, pregnancy and parental leave law, the state sick and safe leave law, 
as well as the pregnancy accommodations law. Okay. So these are the two areas of focus I'm gonna spend my time on today, pregnancy accommodations, nursing uh, accommodations. And those are some, some of the bullet points that we'll review in the next few slides. So uh, nursing, the nursing mother's law as it's titled, um, Minnesota statutes 181.939, expressing um, milk at work. Uh, this, so to answer or address the, some of the questions that were, that were presented in the chat, um, there is no white collar e exemption uh, on the state level. So uh, when we're talking about coverage, uh, the, this law does cover any employer that has at least one employee. So it's very broad in that sense. Um, there's not, uh, there also is not a, a 50, 40 or excuse me, 50 or under uh, provision related to undue hardship. Um, I will go through some of these other details. So the, the main two uh, provisions that the law uh, addresses, and these are going to be somewhat similar to things that Corey talked about, but I'll try to highlight things that, that are maybe a little bit different, but are, are that the um, employer provide uh, unpaid break time to express milk, number one, and number two, that they provide a space. Again, similar to the federal, that it's not a bathroom, shielded from view, free from intrusion, and has access to an electrical outlet. So that last part is different uh, than, than some, that something that Corey laid out federally, that access to an electrical outlet is required in the state level. Um, the, um, we did have a, 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 a situation where, uh, a case where there was an employee that uh, had access to all these things, except that the room was at times being entered by other employees. So in that, in that particular situation or case, we did work with the employer to uh, put a lock on the door. It was a, a case where the employer was going through some remodeling. Um, and so they were stating that they didn't have ability to, to, um, to make that room secure. But um, uh, we, do we often find with cases that, are, that come to us that uh, with a little bit of uh, work, uh, a solution can be found. So uh, with the nursing mother's law, there is also specific anti-retaliation uh, provisions related to it. Okay. And there are a couple exceptions in the law. Corey talked about some of the federal exceptions. I wanna briefly just review the potential state ex exceptions. Um, and there's some quoted language here on these two top points here. And we'll just review those. Those are from the statute. Um, and so it says break time not required if it unduly disrupts the employer's operation. So that is gonna be, I will say that is something that's a very, very high bar. Uh, what it would mean to unduly disrupt. Um, in the cases that DLI has worked on throughout the years, we have not uh, been confronted with a case that uh, the employer could, could show that uh, the break time was unduly disrupting their operation. Um, so it's a very high bar. Potentially, it could be something around uh, a very serious safe health or safety issue. Uh, if the if somebody was to leave their their post or something like that, but uh, again, it's it's a very high bar when it comes to the uh, space. It it does uh, there's similar language to the federal where it talks about a reasonable effort to provide a space. So again, we had a case a few years ago of a security guard. Um, the security guard works for a security company, but was uh, working at a different employer providing security. Um, and in that situation, the security guard company stated that they don't have uh, access to, to locate uh, the building. Um, it's not their space. They don't have a place where the person can express milk. Um, but again, uh, working with through that situation, we were able to uh, find that the host employer um, that, would, that needed the security was, was willing to provide a space uh, that met all the, the requirements. Um, under the law. Okay. Okay, so the other thing I'm going to cover is the pregnancy accommodation law. And again, we can see the statute reference up there if people want to take a look. Um, there are three pregnancy uh, accommodations, again, while an, a pregnant employee working before uh, childbirth. And there's three accommodations that the employer is required to give 
under state law without the employee uh, being, uh, and they cannot require the employee to provide uh, no notice from a health provider um, to be able to, 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 to be required to provide these accommodations. So th those are the top three bullet points there. The more frequent restroom food and water breaks, additional seating or limits on lifting over 20 pounds. If additional accommodations are, um, are requested, uh, then at that point, uh, there would be a, uh, the employer could request um, some type of information from a healthcare provider, um, a doula, a birthing center, et cetera, um, to, 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 that speaks to, that, to the need for that additional accommodation. Um, one of the, a very common type of accommodation is, you know, a, a change to a temporarily to a different position um, with potentially less uh, strenuous work uh, for, for a short time period. Okay. So a key thing with pregnancy accommodations is that um, the employee uh, does need to request the accommodation. So the employer will not, uh, is not required to give the accommodation unless the request is made. And the flip side of that is that employers cannot re require an employee to take the, the accommodation. So it's up to the employee to decide whether um, they want the, the, to, to request um, and accept the accommodations. Um, another case uh, or situation that we'd run across recently was uh, an employer who was requiring, an employee had requested pregnancy accommodations and the employer had uh, decided on their own to put the person out on uh, pregnancy leave on leave from work. And so again, that's a situation that uh, it, it needs to be up to the employee if they would want that accommodation um, or situation or, or, or to take that leave. Um, and this law also uh, specifically prohibits retaliation for those that are asserting their rights under, the, under it. Okay. So going, I kind of laid out a few of example cases, situations that we worked on. Um, and at the beginning of this, I talked about the five provisions of WISA that are enforced by uh, labor and industry. We are primarily an uh, um, enforcement group. We have uh, over 10 investigators that work in labor standards. So we can see we've completed 90 WISA-related investigations from 2014 when WISA was passed until 2020. Um, the pregnancy accommodations uh, provision is the most common um, case we've had. Um, but we do work through many other situations that don't rise to the level of an investigation or a case. There's our phone number, there's our email. We love to um, just work through situations and um, talk through what's going on and help people. And, and if, if need be, take a complaint and start an investigation. Okay. Here's some other resources from DLI. Um, there's a landing page that is we just launched and uh, related to WISA, and I'm gonna throw that into the chat as well. We've got a lot of great fact sheets. Um, we are required by the state legislature to, um, to complete a report and uh, on WISA yearly. So that's another great resource. And we have a link to that on our website. We, do, we love to do outreach and education um, and we do many events. And so we'd love to uh, come to your event if you have any and please invite us. Um, the other thing I want to note, and I think that's the end of my pre presentation, but I also just want to note quickly that there is some pending um, state legislation that would expand, uh, potentially expand uh, the both laws that I covered today. Nursing mothers would potentially uh, eliminate the, uh, the uh, unpaid break time for nursing um, as well, so, so that all uh, all breaks to express milk would be required to be paid. So there is pending legislation that is um, supported by both the House and Senate that would do that. Additionally, um, the uh, pregnancy accommodation um, law, um, there is a pending um, state Supreme Court case, Hendricks Katie, um, that would address uh, the threshold of employees that are uh, needed to require the employer to uh, fall under, to, to, to give those accommodations. So the, there's, there is a provision that says 21 or more employees at a work at a one location, um, which is required as part of the parental leave law. 
And the dispute is whether that also applies to the pregnancy accommodations or not. So we're, we're uh, anticipating that uh, decision to come out soon. Um, the, but the state legislation pending would also potentially address that um, and to bring the pregnancy accommodations uh, similar to nursing, the nursing mother's provision, where it would uh, fall for under every employer that if they have one employee or more in the state. So, okay, thank, thank you, Mary. Great, thanks so much, everyone. And I think that we do actually have time for a few questions and we are getting some really good questions. So I'm gonna just dive in and see how much we can get through. So um, there's one question I think that maybe all three of you might be able to respond to based on your different contexts. Um, if an employee wants to continue to pump beyond one year, is there any backing to do this? Melanie, do you wanna start? Um, you cut out a little bit at the end. If the employee wants to pump beyond one year, what was the rest of the question? Sorry. Is there any backing? Backup? No, I'm sorry. Is there backing or support in the law to do that? Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking, you said about different tribal policies, you know, that like tribes may have different laws. And so I didn't know if you might be able to respond to that. Yeah, um, I can just say, I guess it, it varies by tribal communities and I can't say that I have come across one that allows for provisions of a certain number of years beyond the first year. I think many of them follow that guidelines or they just don't name a time timeline at all. So, and it varies from community to community. That's, that's all I have for tribal response. Yeah. David and Corey, do you have something else to add? Yeah, and just as a federal, from a federal standpoint, that's up to one year is, is how long they could exercise their rights under federal. So if they, for example, if they want to express milk after one year, they couldn't exert, assert federal rights to do so. It would have to be some other rights they would have to lean on. Yeah, and I, I would just say two things. One is that, you know, Corey and I covered the minimum laws, right? We know there are a lot of employers that do offer uh, policies that are more expansive um, that, than, than what we've, we've, we've talked about, what are the minimum requirements? So that's one thing. The other thing is um, the pregnancy accommodations law does not have a one year, um, the, the state nursing mother's law does have a one year limit. Um, the pregnancy accommodations law does not. And I've heard many people uh, state and, and, and describe that the pregnancy accommodations law also covers uh, as, as an accommodation to pregnancy, that nursing is also an accommodation, uh, pregnancy a type of pregnancy accommodation. So uh, we don't have anything, uh, the department doesn't have any official um, statement in that sense, but um, I've heard many people say that that is also covered under the pregnancy accommodation law. Perfect. Hey, Mary can, I throw, Mary, can I throw something else in there that I told myself I wasn't going to forget, but I did forget, and that's the distinction. I think we got a question beforehand, part-time versus full-time. Can part-time employees take advantage of these nursing mother provisions? And the answer is yes. So the law makes no distinction between part-time and full-time. If you're part-time, you have these same rights. Great, thank you. Yeah, that came in as part of the registration. All right, we have another question and it's directed to Corey and David. Um, and then if Melanie, you have anything to add, um, you can jump in afterwards. In public health, um, we say change can happen when you address knowledge, attitudes, and behavior. The attitudes part seems to be the hardest to change in this particular area. Does the Department of Labor have ideas about changing attitudes within the employer world about supporting breastfeeding employees? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll go first. I mean, we, we do, um, you know, primarily we are an enforcement agency, I think as Corey kind of laid out in one of his answers, but um, we are, we, on the other hand, very much so. Uh, we want to make sure that all employers are, are following the law. So um, in that sense, if we have a higher rate of compliance, you know, that's going to, that's going to be very beneficial. Um, I will also point out, um, and I think this was another question that I was going to point this out. Um, the Minnesota Department of Health uh, breastfeeding, uh, breastfeeding friendly workplaces program, which is a really great program that is, you know, we talk a lot about what, what are the requirements that employers need to provide? What are, what's the, what is the bottom line? Right. But then employers come to us and say, well, how do I do that? What's the next step? 
Um, so this is a great program uh, for employers to be recognized for, for healthy uh, breastfeeding policies, as well as um, getting some technical support of, of how to do that. So I'll throw that in the chat as well. Corey, do you have anything to add? No, I wouldn't have anything to add to what David said. I concur though. <laughs> Melanie, do you have anything else to add in thinking about how you change um, attitudes within the employer world to support breastfeeding employees? You know, I, I would just real quick, I, Mel oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Melanie. I was just going to say, I would just refer to my kind of gathering buy-in emphasis and how important that is and the different mechanisms to do so in order to change attitudes and educate. Yeah, Melanie just took, stole, stole, stole the words right out of my mouth. It's it's an employee knowledge of their rights. That lot, a lot of times that's that's the missing piece. So the more employees you know educate themselves of what their rights are, the more likely um, people are not going to be denied those rights. Because it sort of happens like that. And not all employers. I'm not going to say all employers are the boogeyman, but. A lot of times, if you have a group of employees working for an employer and nobody is, understands that nursing mother's rights, then no one will take advantage of the law and, 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 and be able to take time off. So it's an employer knowledge kind of thing um, that really needs to take place. Um, just, just making sure you know what the law is and what your rights are. That's, that's a really important piece of it. Great. All right. I think that we are running out of time. This has just been such a great conversation. And I cannot thank David, Melanie, Corey enough for um, being part of this really important conversation. I believe that there are a couple other questions that we're not going to have a chance to get to during the webinar, but we will follow up with those of you who um, put them into the Q&A um, separately after the fact. Um, and again, I just want to thank you all. Um, for participating. I hope the rest of your week goes well. And as Stephanie mentioned, there will be, um, you will be receiving the slides and a recording of this webinar in the next couple of days. So thank you so much. Thank you.